Welcome to our Tuesday edition of our Saturday Simulcast, uh, joined by Brian Newbert and Tom Deanhart as we break down Purdue and its NCAA tournament appearance as the Boilermakers take on Yale on Friday in Milwaukee. Uh, a lot to talk about after the, after the draw and where the Boilermakers are as they head into the NCAA tournament. I want to thank our sponsor, the Union Club Hotel and the Boiler Up Bar, 811 Restaurant. We appreciate everybody that... Uh, uh, that has, from the Union Club that has supported us. We've enjoyed having our shows there this year, and we appreciate uh, all that they've done for us. So we are in a situation where, Brian, we're in a, we're in a uh, Purdue is now do or die time, and this is a situation where uh, hard to know where the Boilermakers are. They obviously competed well at, at uh, Big Ten Tournament, didn't get the job done, now face Yale on Friday. What's the vibe, at least from today's practice, and uh, what you think as the Boilermakers head into the NCAA tournament? Sorry, I'm just trying to get front lit here. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it, it's everybody's positive. Obviously, they have every reason to be positive. I mean, it's you know, Purdue's had a good season by any objective measure. Uh, I think you know this sort of. I, I don't know how uh, vulnerable they are to pressure. The the enormity of this event, the fact that their fan base has been having a collective panic attack for the better part of three months. Um, I don't know, uh, but I think they should have every reason to be confident. I mean, they've, they've got the personnel, they've got the track record against non big 10 competition. They haven't lost a game this year. Um, it seems pretty loose, but I've never been to a practice where a team hasn't seemed loose. So, um, I can't read their minds. Uh, I think they're <laughs> conscious of the fact that, you know, they, they have to take care of the basketball. And I think, you know, uh, I don't know if anybody's ever articulated this other than, other than Matt Painter, but I think Purdue's first obstacle in the NCAA tournament isn't whoever they have to play. It's Purdue. I mean, that they have yeah. to, they have to take care of the basketball. That's the season. It cost you a regular season title. It cost you a conference tournament title and it'll end your season here if you're not careful. So I think, that's the most important thing by a mile of anything else that'll be discussed uh, here in advance of, you know, Purdue playing Yale on Friday. Why is there any reason to think the, the turnover issues cured? It's going to improve. No, <laughs> uh, <laughs> other than the fact that, you know, Purdue's had good games where they've taken care of the basketball, but then it, it, it surfaces again. So, I think it's the sort of thing that just kind of always sort of hangs over Purdue's head here. It can surface at any time. It's a matter of, you know, uh, being aware of it. Uh, Purdue's aware of it. It still happens. Um, or if it does happen, you know, being that much better and winning anyway, uh, mm -hmm. you know, which is what happened in the regular season finale against Indiana. They did have one of those turnover spells. Um I can't remember exactly what the details were, but it was in the second half and it was like five turnovers in the span, of eight or nine possessions, whatever it is. And that's why that game was as close as it was. Um, but it also, it cost Purdue three games this season. Again, as I said before, it cost you the regular season title, it cost you the conference tournament title. And if Purdue's not careful, it'll end the season. Uh, one would hope the urgency uh, involved at this part of the season would, would, you know, be a safeguard against that. But, Purdue had a championship on the line on Saturday and Saturday, oh, Sunday, Sunday, and it still happened. So I can't figure it out. Um, if, if, if there's an answer to it, you know, hopefully for Purdue's sake, they figured it out because it's, it, it, it's a pretty, uh, a pretty dangerous landmine right now sitting in the dirt. Well, you've talked about the fact it's not necessarily the number, though the number has been high. It's been the seven turnovers and 10 possessions. It's been the, the array, you know, the, the, the onslaught of them at difficult times, like we saw Sunday against Iowa. Now, you play Yale, a team that uh, don't know a lot about, 19 and 11. Uh, it was a little bit of a surprise team uh, beating Princeton, a team that's been the NCAA tournament, beat Baylor, I believe, in 2016. So this is a team that at least a coaching staff that knows how to win the NCAA tournament. But I think that's an interesting storyline for Purdue. It just has to, maybe in some ways, and maybe I'm overthinking this, but the fact that you're moved, playing in Milwaukee instead of Indianapolis, and the fact that you're you know moved away of a, a place that everybody thought you were going to be, 
maybe Purdue will do better in anonymity and just play. I mean, is that uh, uh, overly simplified? Or I mean, and you wrote out the nine things that are, are so the Boilermakers have to watch out for, but uh, it seems to me it just needs to do what it does best to, to have the best chance of moving on. Well, Purdue's not going to be playing in anonymity. Um, you're in the probably the strongest region uh, of the tournament. You're still in the Big Ten footprint. You, so as long as you have an All-American and as long as you have a seven-foot-four guy, you're not anonymous. Um, they're still going to get a lot of attention. They're still going to get a lot of scrutiny. but they're not in Indianapolis. I mean, yeah, I, I agree. Well, My, you know, it was I'm, probably a poor choice of words. But I'm yeah, not convinced I mean, – that getting out of Indianapolis competitively isn't the most terrible thing in the world because it's not right. like your fans I, can't come to point. Milwaukee. Right. It's just that's maybe if there's, you know, a little bit more of a kind of hunkering down kind of thing going on. Right. Um, you know, you're playing in a new facility. There's that sort of newness. There's that sort of discomfort that can be a positive. Um, what good did Indy do last Purdue last year? Uh, and there were fans at those games. Um, I, I don't think it's the end of the world that they're in Milwaukee. I don't think it's even a bad thing, to be honest with you. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Brian, I'm going to, I'm going to make the grand assumption who's going to beat Yale. Who, who, who fear, who do you fear most, Texas or Virginia Tech? I would fear turnovers. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, like, I don't, I don't, I'm almost to the point where like, it like doesn't matter who Purdue plays. It's really? like, if, if they don't turn the ball over, there's nobody they there's nobody they can't beat. If they do turn the ball over, there's nobody they can't lose to. Uh, I think it's really that simple uh, in terms of Virginia Tech or Texas. I wouldn't be afraid of either of them, to be honest with you. I know Virginia Tech's riding a bit of heater here. I know Purdue's uh, track record with Chris Beard in the NCAA tournament is not positive. Um, right. But Texas was a, you know, they were a top four five team in the preseason and they're a six seed. They obviously have had some issues this year. Um, they're a good defensive team. Uh, the one thing that would, I'd, I'd want to stay away from the great defensive teams as long as I could from matchups perspective. But if you want to go, if you want to get where you want to go here, you have to beat those teams eventually. And you may as well play one of them in the second round. Um, is Texas as good defensively as Texas tech was a couple of years ago? I don't know. Um, no, they're not, <laughs> but I will also tell you that Purdue would have beaten that Texas tech team had Isaac Haas not broken his elbow, um, in, in the game prior. And, uh, that's how you counteract that style of defense. Uh, that's really aggressive on the perimeter and, uh, really interchangeable is you pound the ball inside and hopefully you get really high level efficiency, uh, from those guys. And I, I think that against Iowa, uh, you know, Purdue had a matchup where you really needed, you know, 13 of 19 from Travion Williams and Zach Eady as opposed to 9 of 19. I think Purdue's matchup has to be as – matchup advantage has to be as acute as ever uh, now. And I think I think those guys have to be at, at their most efficient of the season now. Um, but I think that you're going to have to play a great defensive team anyway. And if Texas is that team in round two, I would say bring it on. Just don't turn the ball over. I think that, uh, you know, Purdue's played good defensive teams all year long. And, you know, look at the body of work this season. When they don't turn the ball over, they're really good. When they do turn the ball over, you know, with the exception of, of, of the Michigan game in Ann Arbor, which was a total malfunction, every other, you could make a case every other game Purdue lost this season was because of Purdue more than the opponent. Yeah. You, you look at what um... – uh, obviously, there were some interesting developments that came up, obviously, out of Indianapolis. Brandon Newman got a, got a role uh, and looks like it may be a role that will continue to the NCAA tournament. Rotations are important, obviously, and, and especially in the game we saw last year against North Texas. Different situation, I understand. You know, Matt Painter has decisions to make of who's hot, who he's going to play in a situ certain situations. Uh, you know, Sasha Stepanovich using the example you used when writing that, you know, played, got benched in the second half there. Just using that as an example, but how you know is rotation ten? Is it uh, is it truly whatever it takes to be able to compete against a, a and we'll say Yale, but then start uh, with Texas and or Virginia Tech? I don't think it's ten uh, because I think the backup four position is an either or type of deal, depending on matchups. I think 
that's going to be either Ethan Morton or Caleb first, but not both, um, depending on how who the opponent is and how how they match up, things like that. Other than that, I think you're looking at nine guys um, uh, now that it seems like Brandon Newman's back in the mix here. But I also think that, you know, you – dance with the girl that brung you, to, to quote Joe Tiller uh, at this stage of the season. <laughs> I would anticipate Jaden Ivey not coming off the floor very much, foul trouble uh, notwithstanding. Uh, I would anticipate Mason Gillis, you know, being out there as much as Purdue can have him out there. I would anticipate Sasha Stefanovic playing the sort of minutes that he's played all year long, um, you know, provided, uh, pr- provided matchups don't preclude Purdue from using him normally. Um you don't bench the guys who got you this far at the end of the season, unless you absolutely have to. So when people look at, you know, Sasha Stefanovic having a poor shooting game against Iowa and saying, because Brandon Newman played well two games earlier, he should be out there more. It's just not what coaches do. I mean, if, if you can show me another coach somewhere who, who benches his stalwarts uh, because they're struggling halfway through a game, that doesn't happen. Uh, that said, Brandon Newman played well. Uh, he was also 0 for 6 in the second game. Right. Um, so the theory that you, you bench us Stefanovic because he's not shooting well and you put this guy in because maybe he'd shoot better, uh, that just doesn't make any sense to me. But maybe I'm shadow boxing with the court of public opinion here unnecessarily. <laughs> um, but I think it's, I think it's nine guys. Um, but I think it could be like, Depending on how games go, I think it could go down to like six and a half or seven and a half when you you factor in maybe some of your some of your horses taking even more minutes. Hey yeah, Brian, we, we all know yeah we all we all know the importance of Ivy and and Edie. And am I crazy to think this team's going to go as far as Stefanovic's shooting takes it? I think it goes as far if any one element matters most. I think it goes as far as Jaden Ivy's decision making can take it. Mm-hmm. It would be great if Sasha Stefanovic could 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 shoot really well. I mean, he's won games for Purdue before. He can win games for Purdue in the NCAA tournament. That's a big deal. Uh, Three point shooting is a huge part of Purdue's mix. Stefanovic is a huge pillar of Purdue's offense. How they run it structurally, how it how it helps everyone else function, stuff like right. that. But I, I think the singular, you know, Jaden Ivey is going to have his the ball in his hands almost every time down the floor, probably and. I think his decision-making probably looms largest over this team more than anything that and the matchups, uh, you know, Purdue plays big. A lot of other people play small. That's why Purdue got punted last year in the first round is they couldn't match up to a smaller team that could spread the floor and shoot. Uh, So I think I would point to those things. And then I would point to Zach Eady and Travion Williams really being efficient against favorable matchups and staying out of foul trouble. And then probably somewhere along that list, I'd put Stefanovic's three-point shooting. But everybody's three-point shooting. Purdue, you know, uh, has the capability to get really good looks from three-point range. And uh, obviously, when they've been at their best this season, uh, have been really efficient doing so. Yeah, Yale is interesting only because maybe I have the skill to do it, but they are going to have a size. You know, they're not going to bring, I think, their biggest player is six foot eight. They will try to spread you out some uh, it sounds like, but uh, may not have the skill set. But, you know, you look at Williams and Edie, 25 points and 25 rebounds against Iowa. <laughs> that ought to be enough. Um, and yeah, but, I know that. But Iowa's playing small, Purdue's playing big. And it's all about who leverages their matchup the best. Yeah. Right. And when you have a matchup of, you know, Zach Eady and Travion Williams against a six, eight guy to start the game. And then against a small forward for the rest of the game, nine and 19, you know, for two 60% shooters is not, is not what you have in mind, especially when you take into account the fact that, you know, you're going to have to eat some turnovers when you play through the post as much as you do. You have to live through some foul shooting issues because you're as big as you are. Mm-hmm. Um, you don't make one and ones. I mean, it's, it's, yeah. You missed what four of those against Iowa, right? Those got those guys got twenty five and twenty five against Iowa, but that game set up for them to get forty and twenty five. And the Purdue just needs the sixty percent guys, you know, to be at a sixty percent level. Nine and nineteen, you know, isn't going to get it done. I'm not. I'm not saying that those guys were the entirety of the issue for Purdue. Uh, Obviously, they contributed some of the turnovers, but not all of the turnovers. 
by any means, but I think the, I think Purdue needs those guys to be as efficient as possible around the basket. Yeah, you said today, Brian. You thought just from your observations, everything looked like everybody was loose, casual, felt good. Do you get the sense there's any pressure that this team feels any pressure? Uh, nobody's going to say it. Nobody's yeah. going to. Nobody's going to exude it, but I, I, it would be human nature for them to yeah. not, you know, I mean, we've, we've, we've litigated this topic enough, but I mean, we've been, I mean, we've it all been like exposed. It's, been a decade. it's like it's yeah. been a decade. Well, we've all been exposed to the, or we have litigated the, the, the whole topic of how everyone around them has been having a panic attack over, mm -hmm. over this for three months now. And how can that not affect you? And if I were 19 years old and I was playing college basketball and people were talking about me on the internet all day long, I would be on there 24 hours a day and it, it would affect my mental state. And um, I'd be replying to those people, to be honest with you. I don't know how these guys don't, oh. but it would be, it would be uh, again, it, it would be natural for that pressure to, to affect guys. Um, that being said, I don't know if I saw any examples this year of Purdue not playing loose when they had to, Remember, that Wisconsin game was an elimination game for a Big Ten title. Mm -hmm. And I thought they played great in that game. Um, I mean, great's probably overstating it a little bit, but they did everything they needed to do to win that game, except mm -hmm. get a favorable bounce at the end of the game. Um, you know, the Iowa game, how much, whether those were the same stakes, I don't know, but that was that was the turnover issue that got you. I thought otherwise you played okay. Um I haven't seen this being a team that has really kind of buckled under any sort of pressure. If anything, they've, they've played too loose at times. And I think they've played too casual. And that, that, that's, I think that's been the difference between, you know, 27 and seven and, you know, 30 and four or yeah. something like that. And yeah. both a big 10 title and a big 10 conference tournament title. Um, I think they get too casual. Uh, I think you've also seen Purdue at times be better when they're behind in the second half. Uh, I mean, how many second halves were there in games both they won and they lost where uh, they had to dig themselves out of a hole? You would have preferred they have not been in the hole in the first place, but mm -hmm. nevertheless, um, all those games that came down to the wire, uh, you know, Purdue was – Purdue had to come down from a dozen down or something like that at Wisconsin. Uh, you know, uh, Purdue had to play itself out of a hole at Rutgers only to get up pretty comfortably only to, to let it slip again. Uh, so Purdue's, Purdue's done okay this season, I guess, with its back to the wall. It doesn't have all the, all, all the results to show for it it would have preferred, but I haven't seen a lot of indicators of a team that's just going to go out there and choke either. Yeah. Well, I think the effort level too. You talked about that even against Iowa, where you know it wasn't like they weren't giving good effort. They just and they did dig that hole. They got themselves out of the hole, and then they and then like you've been like a broken record. They made some key mistakes at the wrong time that uh, cost them in that game as well. So um, all well, going to be a storyline we'll watch. Go ahead, Brian. You just can't turn the ball over seven times in ten possessions. That's what right. you know. I've been saying all year is it doesn't like if you have fourteen turnovers for a game, fine. Just it can't be that situation where you just change the game in two minutes for the worst. And then all of a sudden you're reeling and you've given your opponent, you know, kind of wind behind its sails. If you, yeah. if you just commit one every two minutes, you know, instead of, you know, bang, 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 bang. And all of a sudden you, you go from five up to 10 down, you know, it, it's just bad things seem to snowball on this team, whether it's, the turnovers, whether it's the foul shooting, whether it's the bad bounces, whatever it might be, uh, that's been kind of the story of the season to a certain extent. And again, I'm going to keep saying this, 27-7, and seven, objectively, by any measure, is a good season. Um, so when we sit here and we talk about Purdue like they're 7-27, and 27, uh, I, I think context really matters here. Uh, but Purdue's just – it's the turnovers. It, it's the only – I know somebody, I'll say this, and somebody will apply free throws, but turnovers are the only thing that matters. They are the only thing that has put position, put Purdue in the position it's in. Right now, having not won a championship, 
it's their greatest fatal flaw. It's their greatest existential threat heading into the, uh, you know, single elimination uh, portion of the season. Um, it's all that matters. If Purdue takes care of the ball, the sky is the limit. If Purdue does not take care of the ball, anything can literally anything can happen. They could be out Friday night for all we know. Yeah. Friday evening, well, Friday afternoon, Friday, afternoon. Like Friday morning, Friday, Friday by dinner time zone. Are you in? Careful. I, yeah, two o'clock. <laughs> Yeah, there, been, but there have been, you know, the Clark Kellogg's and the Joe Lenardi's think they will be not necessarily. Well, one I think picked them to lose early, and uh, or well, both both before. And again, I I think I people are looking at Ken Palm every day, and they still right. see that number one hundred next to their name in defensive efficiency. Mm -hmm. right. And the people who aren't watching the games and are just looking at Ken Palm are sitting here thinking, "Oh, Purdue's terrible defensively. Terrible defensively. They right. they can't beat anybody. They'll give up a hundred points to Yale." It's not the defense. It is the turnovers. The defense, it, Purdue is never going to be a great defensive team. I'm not saying they are, but it is not their greatest problem right now. They have defended well for the last mm -hmm. month. They defended well in the Big Ten tournament. If you, They held Iowa to Iowa, one of the best offensive teams in college basketball, scored 110 points or whatever it was at, at Maryland a couple of a couple of, 112 uh, a couple in of the weeks tournament. ago. They scored 1,000 points against Northwestern, literally 1,000 points. They didn't have enough decimal places on the box score for all the points they scored on Northwestern. You take out six of those 17 turnovers and you held Iowa to 65 points. You had to have Connor McCaffrey, who Purdue has been daring to shoot for four years, is the guy who beat you. Peyton Sanford is the guy who beat you. You did a good job against Keegan Murray. Again, you were good enough to hold Iowa to 60-something points. You were good enough to win that game. The most points you had given up prior to Iowa since the Michigan game was the 72 you gave up to Rutgers when you scored 84. Um, so Purdue's doing okay defensively. It's again, they're not the eighties Pistons. They're not, they're not going to lead the big 10 in, in defense. They're not going to hold you to 50 probably, but they're not going to give you a hundred either. Uh, at this point, there's still some things in terms of matchups, Purdue's playing big. Everybody else plays small ball screen defense is always going to be a problem. As long as you're playing a redwood at center, um, but the people, uh, at a national level who are looking at Purdue and just looking at that Ken Palm defensive ranking, mm -hmm. they, they're not looking at the full story. They're not watching the games. They're not, they're not grasping the context behind that number. Yeah. They haven't watched them play. I mean, that's, that's the other thing. I mean, I, I agree with that up to, I think it is, a, uh, a narrative that's being, being spread around by the Jay Billises and others of the world. But, but to, I mean, it's also understandable because yeah, it's a, I mean, it's a it's, number. I rely on st statistics too. I'm going to look at Yale's right. metrics and say, okay, Yale's good at this. Yale's not good at this. I, I, I'm not saying these guys should be expected to watch every minute of Purdue's game. I'm just trying to add context to what people are going to hear about Purdue here in the next couple of weeks and why some people right. might be saying, you know, Purdue might get upset by Yale on Friday night. No, I don't think that's going to happen. I don't but, think it's going to uh, happen. I'll go, I'll go, but I'll go on. A you never know. I, I mean, it's you never know. Again, you know, you if know. you take care of the ball, you can beat anybody in the country. If you turn the ball over, you can lose to anybody in the country. That that's that's kind of the kind of the nature of this roller coaster of a team. Okay, was as we bring this to an end here. One, you know, one thing we talked about, and Brian, you mentioned a, a couple of things you've written about. Not really overthinking the draw and uh, you know i still would argue you know again purdue has to beat the teams it, it's in front of them the fact that they play can, would play kentucky and, and if they can get that far to the sweet 16 you're going to have to get through teams like kentucky i think it's i think purdue i'm maybe in the minority thought purdue had a good draw because i just don't think baylor is at the level at this point in time of the other of the final four or the other number one seats uh, and I, you know, again, it's just going to be, and I know there's some discrepancy there. Any uh, Tom and or Brian, any other thoughts on that or any, now a couple of days into that, uh, anything else that uh, jumps off the page again, it is what it is. And, and Brian, you've said, well, Purdue just has to beat the team. It's going to have to beat Texas or Virginia tech in game two. If it gets through Yale, that's the simple fact. Yeah. Hats off to Brian and his gentleman's work. I, I read it and listen to the podcast and he's got to be talked and analyzed out here finally get to some more basketball here soon. But, you know, I, I guess I'm a guy real quick. I'm a guy who thinks seeds are, are overrated. I mean, some people think you're going to tiptoe your way to the final four. You're going to have to, you're going to have to beat good teams. And 
And if Purdue, if you talked about it, Alan, they could be staring down Kentucky and staring down Baylor. So, um, and as Brian noted, this is a Purdue team that can beat anybody, but you can also, as we've seen, look awfully pedestrian and possibly get beat by, by anybody, obviously too, the elite teams could, but still, um, it's right there for Purdue. We all know it. And, uh, who knows? Like I said, maybe there's a sense of relief. I know Brian doesn't want to overstate this, but he's mentioned that maybe getting out of Big Ten play helps. Um, we'll see. But again, that, that's not the be all end all. But who knows? Change of venue. I think it's good getting out of Indianapolis. Get away. There'll still be Purdue fans there. I get it. But uh, just get away. You're a number three seed. You're a little under the radar. Um, in some ways, some of the pressure is off, I think. I mean, I, I know there's still pressure. All these fans want the final four. Um, but at this point, you know, everybody's talking about, of course, Kentucky, Gonzaga, uh, all, all those other teams. Mike Krzyzewski is going to be a huge story, too. So then there's Purdue. They're on the radar, obviously, but they're not like they're a number one seed coming off a regular season, a conference tournament title. So who knows? I, I guess I don't know what I'm saying, but <laughs> I'm just glad we're ready to play some basketball here. It's a great event. And, uh, I've got a lot of good memories from, from this over the years, and uh, hopefully all the fans can have some more here too. Well, I would agree. That from a national level, it's very popular to write Purdue off to some extent if you read some of the th- pundits. Uh, uh, and, again, that is what it is. But, uh, Brian, your last word as we uh, put bring this to a close. <laughs> You're done. Victory. I think that's <laughs> Jeff Brown back there in the corner. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm just trying to get front lit. Um, what are my final words? Final thoughts. Final answer. Uh, You're done analyzing. Let's play. Do you want to use a lifeline? Yeah. I did such an awful job covering the Big Ten tournament because that first 9 p.m. game just killed me. And <laughs> I'm looking forward to getting some rest starting over again. Yeah, you here. had a 2 o'clock, and you probably have an early game Sunday, too, or earlier game Sunday, I would think. Well, earlier or play. later because of Krzyzewski. Oh, God. They'll put Krzyzewski in primetime. Yeah. And Krzyzewski's in Milwaukee, right? I don't know. What are you saying? No, I haven't no, looked I mean, at saying, No, I'm saying yeah, Purdue's I don't, not going to get. I mean, it's just, I mean, it's just hard to know. It is, it's almost impossible to know how they're going to slot Sunday's games. I mean, when they would have a, and obviously it's a central time zone too, not that that matters a lot. But, yeah, we'll wait and find out. That one thing at a time, man. but you will, you will have an earlier night on Friday night. That's a good thing. So I'm glad for you from that standpoint, you've been put through the ringer here the last uh, few weeks to say the least. So get yourself a can of Schlitz. Yeah. Yeah. Is that what they that make might there? Do it a bit. Yeah. <laughs> Schlitz. Uh, All I know Milwaukee, about Milwaukee is it's the only major American Milwaukee city light. to have ever elected three socialist mayors. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I think it's on their sign as you drive in, right? So, that is one of the funniest scenes ever in movie history, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know how I get a phone call here in the middle of this, but all right, guys. Uh, we all look right. forward to uh, that. We Safe travels, back. Brian. If Purdue makes it next week, we'll probably have our Saturday simulcast on Monday or Tuesday of next week as well as we prepare for the regional uh, where Purdue, if Purdue can advance, they'll be headed to Philadelphia. And that will be a, uh, uh, but again, it is the proverbial stay. one step at a town, time, and we'll stay tuned on all that front. So, guys, thanks so much. We'll look forward to. Uh, your coverage, Brian, from Milwaukee, and uh, we'll uh, uh, have all that and more in the next coming days on mm-hmm. goldenblack.com. Thanks again to the Union Club Hotel for all of, for its sponsorship, the 811 Restaurant and the Boiler Up Bar. We appreciate all they do for us as well. So we'll see you uh, probably a week from today as we look at uh, uh, the next step in our Saturday simulcast. Thanks to all of you for watching and listening. Mm-hmm.